I'm Mark, and I'm here to tell, talk a little bit about the pre-digital stage of the Silk Road. Uh, when I was a child growing up in Southern California as kind of a surfing nerd in an Asian community, I was always interested in the Silk Road Explorers, and I sat around and read the books of Sven Hayden, Von Lecoq, Marco Polo, Rorick, and all the rest. As I got more into it, I just found out what a rich history of East-West communication there had been way into antiquity. Alexander the Great, who propagated cultural diffusion along the Silk Road. Ibn Battuta, who became the Arab minister to the Yuan court. John Plano Carpini, who met Chinggis Khan, and several other of the great Silk Road travelers. Well, at that point, little did I know that my own life would become so enmeshed in the Silk Road. And for the last 25 years, I've been excavating in Central Asia. Uh, oftentimes at places like this. This is a place in the Gansu Corridor, which was a major thoroughfare of the Silk Road simply called uh, the White Ghost Pagoda. And what's actually a natural feature out there that you can see off in the distance, the locals all think was a Silk Road castle, that there was a great Silk Road battle fought there. It's still inhabited by ghosts, so nobody goes out there. So it's a great place to look for dinosaur fossils. <laughs> uh, well, all of this really led me to make this exhibit and develop this exhibit in New York that's now traveling throughout Asia on the Silk Road and really to bring the Silk Road to a different audience and also place it in a little different cultural context. Most people, when they think of the Silk Road or seen, have seen Silk Road exhibits, it's usually about one place or one locale, and it's usually just high art objects. I wanted to talk about cultural transference and how things and ideas move from east to west. Well, really, what is the Silk Road? Uh, the Silk Road is this interconnected area of trade routes that move both east-west and north-south. And it really was a complex network that included both terrestrial as well as maritime routes that extended all the way from Japan to Iceland, the steppes of Siberia, Africa, and India itself. It traverses some of the great and most beautiful areas on the planet, the steppes of Central Asia, the deserts, uh, the frozen northern Siberian tundra, uh, the Taklamakan, and some of the highest mountain ranges in the world, or the highest mountain ranges in the world, the Hindu Kush, the Pamirs, the Dian Shan, Kunlun, and the Himalaya. Well, a few quick Silk Road facts, just to uh, orient people. It, it existed for at least 3,000 years. I mean, there's certainly incidents of trade that goes back you know, well into the first millennium before the Common Era. At its height from the late Han until the Sung Dynasty, it was over 7,500 kilometers long, and nobody really went the entire way. People would do this in short stages. Camels were the beasts of burden. They've been immortalized in Tang Dynasty art. Most of these were two hump Bactrian camels. Uh, camels have been domesticated for over 4,500 years. They can carry up to 325 kilograms in a single load. They manufacture their own water metabolically, so they're ideal for transport across arid areas. And they can lose up to 20% of their body weight through dehydration. On the Silk Road, the camels were arranged into caravans that are called, called strings, led by a single camel puller of about 25 camels to a string. They can travel 16 to 40 kilometers in a day, but they would need long rests after each journey. Well, cities sprang up along the Silk Road, first as these caravanserai, later then as market towns. And these market towns were vital places for the discussion of politics, for religion for trade and goods. Uh, anyone who's traveled in this area, I'm sure, has been to some of these markets, and I think that they really exist today as they did in antiquity, selling everything from food and spices to like this makeshift hospital at the market in Kashgar. Many extinct cities lie along the Silk Road, uh, the Alexander the, S the Great city of Merv, the Han Chinese city of Zhao He near the Turfan Depression, the Manichaean city of Bezalcook in China, and the beautiful and haunting city of Petra, the Nabataean city in Jordan. But not all the cities are extinct. I mean, here we are in Istanbul, a great Silk Road city and still one of the most vital cities on the planet. Baghdad, Samarkand are both thriving and wonderful places. Uh, Xi'an itself, I think, deserves special note because as capital of Tang Dynasty China, even during the, the darkest period of the, the dark ages in Europe, it had, was a city of over two million people. It was the largest city on earth. It had vigorous communities of Zoroastrians, of Buddhists, of Confucians, of Christians, of Muslims, of Jews. And these places were also important centers of learning, in essence, because the uh, 
you know, that the, the, the astronomer Ulag Beg in Uzbekistan, his cosmological tables are still in use today, that the library in Baghdad actually preserved much of the knowledge of classical antiquity during the Dark Ages in Europe in the sense that so many of the texts that we have today from the Romans and the Greeks were originally translated into Arabic and then have been re-disseminated into uh, the <coughs> languages around the world. Great artistic centers like the monastic center at Dunhuang uh, capture so much of the beautiful art of this period. But the Silk Road was really run by luxury goods. And these luxury goods went between the, the aristocracies of Rome and the aristocracies of China, with the Sogdians, who were the great trading kingdom of Central Asia, sort of in the middle, brokering most of the deals. And not everything went from east to west. A lot of things went from west to east. Peacock feathers, red coral from the Mediterranean, uh, precious metals from Anatolia, from uh, Afghanistan, came things like pigments, like lapis lazuli. Aside from silk, many things came from the east as well, things like jade, things like all sorts of different fruits and vegetables, which really diversified the Mediterranean diet, and especially later in Silk Road history, lustrous porcelain. But silk is really the real story, and silk has always had sort of a cult following almost to say that even Seneca the Younger says, I can see clothes of silk, of materials that do not hide the body, nor even one's decency can be called clothes. The history of silk, of what we know from archaeology, uh, is that the first silkworms are found in the record at about 4,000 before the Common Era, but mostly that people feel that they were raised for food. The actual first silk textiles appear about 2,700 years ago. There's a really interesting Chinese myth about the, the origins of sericulture, and that's that Li Zhu, the wife of the, the, the Yellow Emperor, was sitting under a mulberry tree one day when a silk cocoon fell into her cup of tea and began to unwind. And her and her attendants pulled out one of the fibers, and just seeing how beautiful it was, how it refracted the light, she instructed them to gather a whole bunch more and make a garment out of it. So the origins of sericulture, there it is. Undoubtedly, that's true. But for a long time, Westerners didn't know what silk was. Uh, the Romans, for instance, thought silk was a plant, uh, like the flax plant. And it wasn't until about... 800 uh, that uh, the, the story got out. But what is silk? I mean, silk is just simply that the fibers of the cocoon of the common silkworm. Uh, silkworms are interesting among insects in that they're the only insect that we know of which can only be raised with human cultivation. It can't exist in the wild. A single thread from a single cocoon is 1.2 kilometers long, and it requires 5,500 cocoons to make one kilogram of processed silk. So that's basically about three robes, is 15, over 15,000 individual silk cocoons. Growing silkworms is very difficult. They feed exclusively on the mulberry tree. They're grown indoors. A silkworm gets to be 10,000 times its original weight, and they're extraordinarily fragile. They're so fragile, in fact, that uh, people who are growing silkworms in their houses abstain from smoking, loud noises, even cooking of pungent foods because that it can easily damage their harvest. Well, I think another kind of thing that's quite interesting to look at in the Silk Road is glass, because just like silk was a guarded trade secret amongst the Chinese, glass was a guarded trade secret amongst people in the Middle East. And glass making goes back to the third millennium BC. It's first made in Mesopotamia, and glass blowing originated in the first century in Syria. And glass is, I'm sorry about the typo on this, but glass is a simple formula of lime, silica, and soda ash. Uh, this beautiful vessel that you see here is actually made in the 4th century. It's inscribed with Arabic characters. It was traveled on camelback along the Silk Road and was found at a burial uh, in the Gansu Corridor in western China. But most of the material that glass moved along the Silk Road wasn't as finished goods. It was as glass ingots called cullets. These are about 15 years old and were found on the border between Burma and southern China. These cullets then were remelted and used to make you know, beautiful jewelry like these pieces. These uh, glass pieces were held as high regard as precious gemstones during uh, imperial Chinese times. These particular pieces of jewelry range from about 2,500 years old to about 800 years old. 
Paper was something else that was uh, moved along the Silk Road. It was developed in China over 2,000 years ago. It spread to the West after the Battle of Tala in uh, 751, during the Islamic conquest of Central Asia. And it was instrumental in spreading Islam and literacy. Previous to this, writings would mostly be ba made in these xylographs uh, composed of bamboo shreds like you see on the left. But you can just imagine how easily things like the Quran, things like other writings could be distributed quickly and easily and cheaply when printing came along. I think that the preeminent Silk Road scholar of today is a woman named Shinru Lu, and she's written recently a couple of very important books just about cultural dissemination along the Silk Road. And you know, she's argued very persuasively that it's not stuff, it's the ideas. Religion is obviously one of these. Uh, Buddhism, although it was present in China, it was made popular in the Tang Dynasty. It was brought to China by Zhuangzhang, who was a monk who traveled in India for 17 years. And it's his story that the Chinese classic, The Journey to the West, is based on. And wherever you go throughout the eastern part of the Silk Road, you'll see vestiges of its Buddhist past, like this uh, carving on the Yellow River at Bingling Zi. Christianity had its origins in the Middle East, but by the time it got to China, it, it was adopted in its Nestorian form, which actually originated here in Istanbul, which recognizes the disunion between the human and the divine Jesus. It's now extinct, but it was a powerful force in the East, so much so the stele, which still exists in Xi'an today, written in traditional kanji characters, is capped by this capital of Christian iconography. Islam expanded into Central Asia during the Rashidun and Umayyad caliphates, and until the Mongol conquest, Bukhara, Samarkand, Urgenk, and others were very important seats of learning. Well, one of my favorite things about the Silk Road, and, and I think is relevant to this conference here, is just how style is transmitted. If you look at the centerpiece, that's a silk uh, tapestry woven in China with Chinese characters on it, but containing almost exclusively Persian motifs of unicorns, of phoenixes, of other things. On the right are ritons. Uh, ritons were the drinking cups of classical antiquity in, in Crete, in Greece, and in Rome. Well, the lower one is a Sogdian one from what's now Uzbekistan, crafted out of, out of uh, gold and silver. While the upper one is a Tang Dynasty one created out of pottery in China. So it's the exact same form with a... It's, moved along the Silk Road, just made with local materials. Well, about 800 years ago, the Overland Silk Route collapsed, and camel caravans like this one coming into the Nabataean city of Petra really, really, really quit carrying the predominance of goods. Now, this is for a number of reasons. One is that Central Asia became destabilized, and it was less easy to move camels through these area, camel caravans through these areas. The other is that the nature of the goods changed. It went from primarily silk, to other things like, like pottery and ceramics and porcelain, which were much heavier and much harder to transport. So the Silk Road went from an overland uh, journey to a maritime journey, and that's still ever-present today. Anyone who travels in South Asia today just knows how it is. Now, what really fueled this was a, was a renaissance of shipbuilding by Arab shipmakers, as well as new navigational tools which allowed people to be able to travel uh, long distances and make open water voyages. These dows which carried these goods had these primitive shipping containers on the inside of them, which are these big clay vessels, which uh, in wrecks that they find today are still completely loaded with luxury goods moving both east and west. The harbors of Singapore, places like that today, look pretty much like parking lots for container ships. And if we follow sort of the maritime traffic of today, uh, you can look by the brightest blue line uh, throughout the south of Asia. This follows the exact same route of the ancient Silk Road traders from the, the, the coastline of East Asia through the Malacca Straits to the tip of India to the great trading towns of Goa and then to the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea and into the Mediterranean. This is somewhat mirrored by air traffic, the same sorts of things. We can see uh, a lot of activity in East Asia linking it with Europe. And now we come to the internet. This is uh, something done by Chris Harrison just a few weeks ago based on last year's internet traffic. Uh, we see a tremendous amount of traffic between North America and Europe. 
but we don't see a whole lot coming out of Asia. And in talking to him about this and stuff, we were just comparing it with a map that he did like this about three years ago, and Asia was even darker. And the way things are expanding, I think that as we move forward, as we look at where things are going, I would predict within the next 10 years, if not in the next five, you're going to see the same incandescent glow coming out of Asia that you see coming out of Europe and North America. Well, what did the Silk Road really do from a modern perspective? The Silk Road really is the, the first major attempt at globalization in an organized sort of fashion. It's created the first international banking system. It opened up the world to a rash of new products and ideas. In antiquity, the cities of Samarkand, Xi'an, etc., were the most cosmopolitan, tolerant, and polyglot on Earth. So where does this leave us of where we're going today? I think if there's one thing that all of the Silk Road travelers that I mentioned early in my talk that they remarked about is just that how these cities worked, how trade worked, how people were able to get along with one another with their eye on one thing. So to do that, I just think that we all have to get along with one another. So thank you.